quite a few questions have come in. I've been ticking them off as we go because I think a number of them have been addressed, but there's a few. I just want to basically an open panel now. Um, again, I'll get you just to stick your hand up if you think you can answer it, you've got an answer. But one of them, and it was touched on a wee bit, I think Rick touched on it before, was um, how do catchment leaders include and account for both Maori landowner participation and support Maori values and approaches such as Kaitiaki Tanga? And Rick, there you go. You'd sort of addressed it before, but do you want to give us a bit more in depth? Yeah, look, um, yesterday I was in, in conversation with um, with um, some of our Māori leaders in our community. And, um, you know, with, with the central port, we'll, just, we'll back up a little bit with COVID just going um, uh, through the community and us coming out of it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of money available to help kickstart communities. And, uh, I mean, there's a real opportunity to uh, work with the young people, uh, young Māori and, and Pākehā, to give them an understanding of what's under their feet um, in terms of those those cultural values around Kaitiaki Tanga, because it is once they get to understand that, it's seriously powerful. And um, talking to the Māori leaders, um, you know, that's a great way to, you know, get young Māori to connect back to um, their ancestral roots. And um, so we're looking at, and I know there's another number of initiatives around the country, and including in the Waikato, where um, uh, we get young Māori um, involved in nursery, planting, um, and then weed control um, across our community and, and teach them some skills. And, um, you know, if you think of that about the Billion Trees program and uh, the, th the things we need to do on our farms to uh, re restore... Um, uh, you know, or get the right environmental out outcomes around um, fresh water, greenhouse gas, and biodiversity. There's a heap of planning needs to be done over time, and there's a real opportunity to uh, for business startup with young young Maori and, and Pakia to to help drive that. Brilliant. And Roger, just briefly, did you have something you want to add to that one as well? Yeah, really briefly, um, Aaron. Look, you haven't got a community catchment group if you don't include your iwi. It's as simple as that. You cannot have a community catchment without including your iwi. They're part of our community. Um, and uh, then they may not be as dominant and, 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 and progressive going forward um, to join these groups. So you've got to ask, you've got to be, you've got to be conscious, you've got to, get on, you've got to, you've got to actually uh, um, communicate with them and, and welcome them along. But you don't have a community catchment group or a sub-catchment group if you're not connecting. It's as simple as that. You're, you're in Lululand um, if, you, if you're not connecting. Uh, because then it just becomes a farmer's group. But you've got so to the, for it to be successful. So on the, actually on the same theme, but you know, communities, um, everybody involved, who's got uh, non-farmers in their catchment? Did you get them involved? How did you get them involved? Who wants to give us some wise words on that one? I'm looking, I'm looking, but no, Roger's waving his hand. Where you go, Roger? Yeah, I'll wave my hand again. Yep, we, we've, got, we've got the activists in our area, and we specifically invited them along to see what we're doing so they understand what we're doing as farmers. All they do is see dirty water coming down the, down the river. We had a, um, a fishing tourism thing that was complaining all the time. We specifically asked them along, say, look, come on, community ca catchment group, um, and get them involved. You have to. Whereas, once again, you do not have a community catchment. Um, you have a farmer's, farm, a farmer's um, talk fest. Uh, how can you tell your story if you do not invite all these different people along? They might not come to every single meeting, but they must come along and be involved. And Mark, were you just putting your chin in your hand, or did you want to answer that? Yeah, one well? yeah. Look, it, it, it's it's not it's it's not straightforward because um, you know farmers, you know, we, we're, we're businessmen, we run our own businesses, and and we can manage our hours and 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 our workloads. And we, we had um, a couple of folk coming along from town. Um, and, and when when our uh, catchment group was in its early stages, but they just couldn't afford to, and, and they you know they had jobs and they had other commitments, and they they just fell away. And yet, when they were there, they they were contributing. And so, it's trying to put put together a structure and and some time frames that that make it easier for the community to engage, the wider com community to engage. That's right. uh, Anna. Um, so uh, we have struggled. I can't, I'm not like Roger. I can't, um, he's cut me out. We don't even have a community catchment group. 
So it's not through lack of trying, but it's bloody hard work and we just have to keep working at it quietly and it's little steps. So I think you're a bit harsh, Roger. Um, our iwi up here are really focused on their, their um, settlement, um, Waitangi Tribunal settlement, and we just haven't been able to get um, much, make much leeway with them. So we're trying for the people that are asking to really do it on a, in a sub catchment level. So just at Hapu Marae level, like really, it's really basic and, and, and that, that's really helpful. But um, yeah, I just, for me, I believe you can have a community catchment group. It's not as broad as you want it, but um, I believe it's better to get on and do something as a group of farmers and take make some steps than to get hung up and knock yourself around and really yeah, get derailed without having the full community um, being part of it. So my, my, my advice would be just keep going and get on with it and do the best you can, but little steps happen um, slowly. Oh. Sorry, Roger, I am going to just cut on to the next question there, just in the interest of time. We can continue some of this discussion on later, I think. But one question that's coming in multiple formats is around the, the employed people, whether it's part-time, full-time, you know, your coordinators, your admin people, whatever you call them. Um, their job description, what's their role that they actually play? What are you actually getting them to do? I think you've touched on this a wee bit, but um, what are they doing, that, the tasks you're handing them to, the roles you want them to do? Who wants to talk about that one? Okay, Rick. Can I start, Aaron? Yeah, look, it's, it's more of a facilitation role at the start, I, I believe. You know, just bringing all the strands together and joining the dots. You know, there's um, most important at all, uh, uh, you've got to have uh, the regional council sitting alongside, uh, tapping into the resources, funding where available, and getting them to do some work for you too, you know. They, they've got, they've got um, people that can... can uh, can do some stuff for you. So that's really important. So creating that partnership and, and look, in our case, we've created a partnership with all the sector organisations and have that memorandum of understanding. So the facilitator actually glues all, all that together and gets it going. So, and then they, you know, facilitators have, have a set of skills that they can tap into perhaps other people's skills, like um, outside the community, as I mentioned before, might be a retired person they can come in and, and just help with various things. So um, really important to, to have someone glue it all together and, and keep things going. And on that, this will probably be the last question. There's a number of questions we're not going to get to today, unfortunately, but we'll, some of them I've tried to pick out the key ones. Others we can address uh, when we click out an email with the various links to people that are listening. But Roger, a number of you talked about it being farmer-led, bottom-up, you know, engaging the community, that sort of thing. But we've also said um, farmers have limited time, are busy, they're carving, they're shearing, there's crops and all that sort of thing. So hence why you have employed four or part-time professionals to do that. How do those third parties, those people that may, may or may not be farmers, but they are in a different role, how do they go about getting farmers engaged? If you, if you want to be farmer-led and farmer-up, but you're also having a, an employed person to do it, how does that work? Okay, Anna, that was a hand wave. Well, well you enough. could make them a farmer, but yep. there's one way, like, or, or an ex-vet that helps, you know. So it's picking the right person. On, I think it's the people that are great community, communicators and are doing it for the right reason. So I'd go back to Mark's why. Why are they wanting to take that job? And I think if it aligns really well with your group's why, then it'll work. And um, I don't think there's a massive... Uh, list of skill sets that are essential it's great to have some but it's i just think them having the real passion for what you your group has a passion for is just essential brilliant lots of thumbs up and hands up and mark you want to add to that yeah uh, um, something that i, I think ecan did successfully do and it, it de developed a really good um partnership with landcare trust and landcare sort of came in and and um and you and sort of identified professionals within industry um, and got them into sort of facilitation roles. And you'd have to ask Rhys Taylor just what really went on there and, and what that process looked like. Um, but, you know, this, was, this is how industry can contribute. They have those skills within their ranks and freeing them up to allow them to move into a facilitation role uh, um, is, is, I think, a, a, an, an, an under-tapped resource 
in New Zealand? How, how, how can wider industry play their part when they have access to those skills? I just think there's, there's, there's something there that we could be looking at. Brilliant. Okay, Rick, you get last, you get the last session. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Just quickly, the, having the likes of beef and lamb or dairy and zed, um, you know, in our case, Zespri and New Zealand Avocado, sitting alongside as a pan sector of uh, food producers are very, very powerful. And I think um, it gives farmers a confidence to this stuff. At the end of the day, it's all around going to be based around your FEP or what we call LEPs. So, um, and farmers are going to have to do this by 2050 by the sounds of things. So um, having beef and lamb help um, and, and the other sector organisations help um, uh, step through the farmers through that process is really, really powerful. Brilliant. Thanks, Rick. And look, it's just ticked over three, so we could go on for a lot longer. We may end up doing a second one. We're going to have a bit of a debrief, look at the questions and issues we didn't cover. Possibly there will be a part two, no promises. We definitely will get out to you, um, to the, all of you that are listening, that have registered a link so you can watch this again, um, links to some of the information we've talked about and hopefully address some of the questions that, that we didn't have a chance to address. But before I wrap up, I really want to thank our, our six speakers who, who came on today, um, five of them with a bit of preparation and one, Josh, who uh, came in at, at short notice but did a great job filling in for Ben. So, but Roger, uh, Mark, Peter, Rick, Anna and Josh, thank you all very, very much. It's been a, um, a fairly heavy duty hour and a half and we've covered a lot. But look, on behalf of Beef and Land New Zealand, thank you all for coming on. I think the key message out of all this, and we talk at the end of some of these things about doing a call to action. Well, literally, this is a call to action. It's the message you've heard over and over today is about this being farmer-led, being community-led, being bottom-up. Don't wait for these things to be done for you. Don't wait especially for these things to be done to you. This is your chance as, as communities, rural communities, to get on the front foot and, and get on with these things. We've heard a lot of experience, a lot of advice around that from our speakers. We've got a whole lot of that stuff in our role as Beef and Land New Zealand to support that. It's not our role to lead and make it happen, but we will grease the wheels, help it happen as best we can, and uh, we'll send out that information to you. But look, from the Beef and Land New Zealand team, and on behalf of the, the uh, farmer speakers today, thank you all very much, and uh, all the best out there with your community group futures. Thank you.